Hi everyone, I'm Cornelius of Dimicato Scola and welcome back to our wee little fencing theory series. When working on the script of episode 3 of Timing in Hema on three levels of difficulty, I not only noticed that it was about to become a quite long video, but also that half of it was elaborating on topics I had presented before. What is more, I learned that I had made some inaccurate statements in the last videos that needed correction or at least refinement. I have therefore decided to split the last episode into two, something uh, other people have done before, uh, or rather squeeze in a supplement episode, if you will, before the advanced class. Here we go, some errata and addenda to the first two videos. It can help to revisit certain topics or look at them from another angle. My own understanding of timing theory will never be exactly that of someone else, even if that someone is a year-long fellow martial artist or fencing student. Learning how other people understand or apply the same concept can improve one's own understanding. And for a teacher it is beneficial to have multiple ways to explain one thing, because one of these may be the one that a student needs in order to finally get the idea. One very basic example, the timing framework outlined in the first video, has certain similarities to what you take into consideration when approaching a green light at an intersection, when riding a bike or a car with significant speed. You want to cross the street safely while the green light is on, but you don't know when it will switch back to red. What is more, you don't want to needlessly stop at the green light because you are too cautious and neither do you want to run over the red light, unless of course it uh, goes to red immediately before you cross, in which case it doesn't really matter, and let alone be hit by a truck coming from the side. When approaching the intersection, you know that there will be a point when you have to decide whether you can cross safely or have to stop. This is what I called a moment of stillness in the first video. It is when we briefly pause and decide the next move. Knowing whether or not you can make it while the light is green depends on how much distance you can cover in the split seconds that follow this moment. The split seconds, or the distance, define your single continuous movement, or tempo. Placing the moment of stillness too early or too late may lead to you running over the red light. If you place it too early and then accelerate your bike or car, your tempo will be too long, and if the light switches to red shortly after, you might be unable to stop in time. If you place your moment of stillness too late, it means that your previous tempo, before that moment, is also too long, and you keep racing towards the intersection with no chance to stop in case the lights go red. If you have some experience in road traffic, you will, of course, know what you do in such a situation. You carefully approach the green light, maybe slowing down just a little, knowing how much distance you can cover at your current speed. This informs you about the moment of stillness, that is, where the point is when you make your decision, or the point of no return, if you will. Unless you are a douchebag, begging your pardon, you will not approach the intersection with a spurt hoping that everything will go well and thereby also lengthening your tempo and uh, the distance you cover. Still, in fencing practice we frequently do exactly that. Instead of carefully and patiently approaching, in our terminology this means using short, single, continuous fencing movements that are easy to manage, we rush in with long actions, meaning long tempi, depriving ourselves of moments of stillness that would have allowed us to react to our opponent. If you want a graphic example, the average HEMA full-speed sparring approach translated to traffic will look like this. Feel free to use this analogy in your fencing classes, but don't dream too much about swords when you're on the street. I take no responsibility for any accidents that occur. Let's have another look at sources from the German Lichtenauer tradition that explain the term INDES. In fact, I have to correct a mistake here that I made in the first video, but I will touch upon a different problem first. INDES can be translated as meanwhile, 
as we have learned. So it refers to simultaneousness and literally it means in that or in the referring to something in which something else happens. In the glosses of the Lichtenau tradition you will not only find situations where it clearly refers to your action running while the opponent's action takes place, in which case the word's meaning appears to be obvious. But you will also encounter several situations where you are instructed to act in des after the blades have made contact without any action initiated by the opponent. The glosses for the Krumpau, the crooked strike in the so-called Peter von Danzig manuscript, instruct that als bald die Sphere zusammenklitzen, so wind in des gegen deiner linken Seiten die kurz schneid an sein Schwert und stich ihm zu dem Gesicht which roughly translates to as soon as the blades clash, wind the short edge in this or meanwhile to your left side and thrust towards his face. Nothing is mentioned of what the opponent is doing. Nothing that could be seen as the duration of an action to which the word in this relates. From the text alone, one would have to assume that the winding takes place in the moment of contact, a situation that we created, not the opponent and a moment of stillness according to our theoretical framework. When blades meet, the Lichtenauer fight books emphasize sensing what the opponent does through the blade bind, which is one of the fastest ways to process a signal that uh, the opponent gives. If they build up pressure to move our blade aside, which usually is described by stating that they are strong at the sword, we can regard this pressing as an action, so acting in des or meanwhile makes sense, as we react while they act. We already covered this timing-related understanding of the term. The same is true if they disengage. They start a fencing motion and we can act while they perform it. But what if the opponent does absolutely nothing, or is, to use the terms of the text, weak or soft? We absolutely can start a new action right after the clash of blades, or while the blades clash, but how reasonable is that against the resting opponent who could react at any time? Are we not giving them a signal, a tempo to use against us? In the first video on timing in HEMA, we already touched upon the fact that you can act while the opponent does nothing. The time you have at your disposal for such an action is more or less their reaction time, that is, before they realize what's happening, or rather, before the counteraction they want to initiate becomes problematic for us. Usually this is significantly less time than that provided by a regular fencing action, for example a cut with a sword or a step. Probably for this reason, the action suggested in the Lichtenauer texts for how to act first when the opponent is still and or weak in the bind are very short. For example, you are supposed to move your sword in a way that gives you greater mechanical strength and then threaten a target as in the Krumpau gloss. If the opponent does not act, but their blade stands strong as a pillar, we could step laterally to shift the central space and either get a new opening or provoke a reaction that we can use. What you should rather not do is leave the bind, as this would often come with a longer path the sword has to take, hence it takes a longer time to execute and the opponent can still follow even after their reaction time has passed. There are a few examples where you do leave the bind in such a situation. For example, in the teachings of the Northern Italian master Fiore de Liberi, but I strongly suspect there must be an element that prevents the opponent from immediately following and countering you. Be it the impact of the clashing blades that can, in a way, paralyze for a split second, or a mechanical advantage you have gained, for example, by placing your blade on top which is something the Lichtenau tradition occasionally emphasizes. Such an advantage, too, increases the time before the opponent's possible counter can take effect. And we will look at such cases later in this video. But now we come to my error in the first video, where I simply equated in des with while another action is running. As I learned later, big thank you to Michael Chittister at this point, the 14th and 15th century sources only use the term when referring to actions from the bind. That is, if I haven't overlooked anything, um, feel free to point me to a counterexample. Because of this relation to blade binds, in des is mentioned in the glosses together with the word fühlen, meaning to feel or to sense. 
working in this from the bind can still be a contra tempo or mezzo tempo action, but if you do a cross check, the glosses do not use the term in this when describing tempo actions without blade contact. For example, when the opponent strikes at your sword and you remove it so that they only hit empty air. This is a classic use of timing, but in Lichtenauer texts they would use other terms than in des to express the simultaneousness. Therefore, in des in a strict sense cannot be understood as temporal after all. The oldest source of the Lichtenauer tradition states that you decide the next action while, or in des, the blades bind to one another. It therefore refers to the simultaneousness of that bind and your sensing, but not so much to the duration of an action or of hesitation which we use to our advantage. Our timing theory from above still holds water, in my humble opinion, so acting against a resting or soft or weak opponent should be done with short movements. But I will stop using the term in des to refer to the tempo of the hesitation, as it were. Instead, in des seems to exclusively refer to acting while the blades meet and you feel the opponent's actions. You also may or should act while the opponent does something, but this temporal simultaneousness is not the same as what is meant with the word in des. Sorry for getting this wrong earlier. Speaking of corrections and terminology, I have previously argued against the idea that for and nach very broadly refer to having or not having the initiative, which implies that they can shift back and forth between the fighters, just like in stage combat, where one pushes back the other and vice versa. Instead, I had assumed that you can only get the for from a moment where both combatants are still. This is because the glosses clearly state that nach actions are the counters, so every time you react to your opponent, even if you dominate the fight for a while, you act in or from the nach, because you necessarily have to go after your opponent's actions, so to speak. The early sources, as far as I know, do not suggest the concept of regaining the four from a counteraction. Exceptions can only be found in the Master Sigmund tradition of the Lichtenauer glosses, and later in Joachim Meyer's book. However, these texts were available very early in the history of modern Hema, and Meyer was drawing on texts from the Sigmund tradition, among others. So it is no surprise that the idea of for and nach as alternating states in a fight became common knowledge in our community, in contrast to applying these terms on a microscopic scale for every single fencing action. That being said, it is perfectly plausible that while these fighting traditions were still alive, the same terminology was applied to slightly different concepts or movements. You are in the four when initiating the first action when both were still, but by being four you also dominate the fight as you took initiative. Because otherwise there might be the contradiction that four is at one point described as acting before the other guy, but someone who performs a successful nach technique would also end up in the four, which would be this macroscopic perspective where the terms describe who is dominant. My preference to understand for and nach on a microscopic level, if you will, referring to single actions rather than general developments in a fight, still appears to me as the most helpful when deciding what actions happen at which point in time. If you do everything correctly and use timing to your advantage, you will also be dominant as a consequence. So I do not see much sense in labeling something that is just the obvious result of something else. However, reconciling both interpretations can work when you assume that after a successful counter from the Nach, you arrive at the fore because you have started something to which the opponent now has to react. It comes before their next move. In fact, I once posted a little diagram on Facebook with exactly this interpretation, and it would allow to harmonize the evidence we have for all counters being nach, but also that they can get you back into the four if done well. But let's not forget that only few sources speak of regaining the four. To conclude, I assume that these technical terms might not have been understood and used as precisely as we would like it, just like the word tempo came from an action's duration, but was also understood as an opportunity to strike, even though the latter is a consequence of the former and not the same thing, strictly speaking. I guess you can allow for some terminological leeway if you still know how and why things work.
The hesitating or lurking opponent was also covered in my second video on timing in HEMA. I used the firm-footed lunge, the distesa a pie fermo, in the tradition of the Italian rapier teacher Salvatore Fabris, as an example to show that the durations of your actions matter, especially if the opponent can easily defend because they are still or because their weapon can quickly reach yours or both. Instead of doing a single action lunge, where the front foot leaves the ground, moves forward and makes contact again while the weapon and body stretch forward, I argued that against the resting opponent, Fabris advises to keep the foot floating in the air, so speso in aria, as it is called in similar situations. So you have an additional moment of stillness to decide if and how to continue. One comment on that before we go on. A possible objection to this way of proceeding is, if I lift the foot, the opponent knows what's coming, so why do this slower action instead of a non-telegraphed lunge? Well, there are two reasons. First, in the situation against a well-trained arresting opponent who keeps their weapon close to yours, such a lunge still takes too long. Deal with it. Even Olympic fencers usually perform direct attacks into a tempo of their opponent, such as an improvident step or a brief moment of distraction. My own sports fencing coach said that a direct free hit in epee fencing comprised the entirety of fencing knowledge, as it was much harder to pull off than a riposte or other counteraction. And if there really is no tempo when they lunge, except for the opponent's reaction time, they have to get so close first that they basically hit mid-lunge. This means that after the hit has landed, they still have to stop the lunging motion before they can recover. So their tempo continues, if you will. They are still frozen in motion, as Stephen Perlman would say, the author of the Book of Martial Power, and the opponent could perform an afterblow in the meantime. This does not matter much if you have the right-of-way rule or you have an electric scoring system with a short cutout time, but it would be problematic in an earnest duel. For our own thinking about timing, let's note down that there might be circumstances in which you consider Tempe only up to the point where a hit is made or control established even though the motion affecting this might continue. Be that as it may, if you need a lunge to reach your opponent, one continuous lunging motion takes too long if that opponent is resting and has their weapon in front of them. But there is a second important counter uh -huh, to this accusation that a two-part lunge was just unnecessary telegraphing. The simple fact that you do not inevitably complete the lunge and do what the opponent was already expecting. Instead, you observe for a split second and then either you can continue and anything the opponent does will be too late at this point, because you're already halfway there, or they react to it and thereby give you an action to work with for the completion of the attack. Whatever they do, as a trained fighter you can keep your advantage. That's the catch-22 approach that I mentioned in the second video on timing in HEMA. But when speaking about the two-faced Tessa earlier, I was not entirely true to Fabris' teachings because, as usual, I had not read the source carefully enough nor thought it all through. I'm very grateful to Julian and Florian from the Vienna-based club Sprezzatura for having discussed this issue with me, as this made me aware of my grave misconception. Here's the deal. Fabris suggests to lift the foot and then assess the situation. That much is correct. However, there are two ways to proceed now, depending on what the opponent does. Well, excluding options that would significantly alter the situation. If they now give a small tempo, for instance by disengaging or even attacking, we can strike in that tempo by putting the foot forward and on the ground, maybe a bit farther than intended, especially if the opponent retreats, and leaning into the thrust. But if the opponent does nothing, and contrary to what I showed in the second video, we actually cannot strike just yet, as they would still have enough time to push our blade aside. This is because the opponent, in rapier fencing, has their weapon in front of their body, so they only need a very short movement to deflect our blade. This makes everything so annoyingly fiddly here. In longsword fighting, as we will see later, the temp usually are a bit longer, which gives us some leeway. But here, if the opponent remains still, we cannot put the front foot down and thrust in one go. At least not in Fabris proper. They would still be able to defend. Instead, we put the front foot down where it would be in a completed lunge, that is in the misura stretta or short measure, but only the foot. Our body remains where it was. 
We therefore prepare getting into striking rage without bringing our body there just yet, secretly sneaking in, as it were. Apparently, Capoferro does the same thing, only in certain situations, putting the front foot forward so that the actual lunge does not involve foot movement. At this point, we assess the situation again, and if the opponent still does not act, we finally strike, as we now only have to shift our body, which ideally is so fast that they cannot possibly get in our way. Mind you that throughout this situation we have the weapon under control and see a target. If that was not the case, we would have to establish control first. Therefore, against the resting opponent, Fabre suggests not one or two, but three actions or tempi to make a hit. Lifting the foot, putting it down, and striking. What is the purpose of that? The purpose is to ensure that each action, including the final hit, can be successful. Each of them is so short that the opponent can hardly react to them in a reasonable way. If they try to react at one point, our action would already be over and we would be in a moment of stillness, ready to counter their attempt of a counter. It is necessary to use such short motions, as I stated earlier, because the opponent has their blade close by and would not need a lot of time either if they wanted to prevent our action. If you want to experiment with this situation to see if you really have to be that meticulous, get someone who tries to defend against your attacks from all three of these stages, striking from front foot still on the ground in wide measure, front foot in the air, and front foot on the ground in short measure. But make sure that you do not introduce any other weapon or body movements, as this would alter the entire situation and make a different approach necessary. Aside from the possibility of the opponent parrying your thrusts, which I used as an example to show how important it is to use short tempi, the moments of stillness between the three stages also allow you to react with other appropriate counters, and these might change depending on which stages you have already completed. For example, the reaction to a disengage could vary depending on whether you have your front foot on the ground in wide measure, in the air, are already placed in short measure. In each scenario, the time you need to land a hit is different, the time the opponent would need to hit you is different, and perhaps even how the weapons can move in space is different. Because of all of these implications, each stage might require a different counter. There are two things to learn from this example of a three-stage lunge that go beyond what we discussed in the second timing video. First, it shows the major difference in the tempi that an acting and arresting opponent give you. Actions against a resting opponent, at least in this case, can only be half as long, roughly speaking, as those against an opponent who performs a weapons action. A foot movement would be even longer. I would say that, as a rule of thumb, out of the three stages of a lunge against a resting opponent, two can be combined when the opponent gives you a weapon-based tempo. Such a weapon-based tempo keeps them busy long enough for you to either lift the foot and place it down in short measure, combining the first two short tempi into one, or to put down the foot and strike, combining the second and the third tempo, as Fabris himself describes. All three may be combined when they take a step, as this renders them unable to react for an even longer period. Observations just as these might help sharpen our awareness of what can happen in a fight. I have stated earlier that against a resting opponent who waits for you to make a mistake, you have only little more than their pure reaction time, or latency if you will, for a successful action. Fabris just gave us an example of how long exactly this could be, measured in actual body motions. Please note that the entire calculation might be different if one combatant keeps their weapon withdrawn, or both do so, or if other factors change. It is also interesting to note that there might be actions involved that are so short that you cannot possibly take their tempo, but let's save this problem for later. Returning to Fabris' distessa and the floating foot, it is a bit tricky to find out how exactly you ought to move your feet. Does lifting the foot already include moving it forward? or is moving forward part of the putting down, or a bit of both. In my second video I referred to the fencing lessons given in two German manuscripts, one of them commissioned by Johann Georg Pasch in 1671, even though the lessons themselves are much older, and perhaps from the time of Fabris' student Heinrich von Unzumfelde.
who is probably the author of the uh, very Fabrician rapier treatise in the same manuscripts. Pasch himself only added a short section on parries and holds. Sorry for getting this wrong earlier. In any case, in these lessons, which I will call the Dresden lessons for the sake of simplicity, the floating foot is mentioned several times, but it is supposed to be floating in narrow measure. So basically above the spot where Fabres would want you to put it down against the resting opponent. This means two things. First, the lunge has only two tempi there indeed, just as I said in my first video. Both foot movements are suggested against a resting opponent in several situations in these lessons, so they qualify as short enough so the opponent cannot possibly exploit them. Second, if they are that short and quick, in the first movement, lifting the foot into narrow measure, you must necessarily keep your foot very close to the ground. This probably resembles what Fabris describes as the indoor version. You might remember that Fabris states that some people solve the problem in advancing by sliding the front foot into short measure. This obviously only works if the ground is even, so in the salle or in the modern training venue. Both the sliding and lifting the front foot, as in the Dresden lessons, require even ground, but as a consequence you only need two short tempi instead of three. However, this only works if you bring the foot up and forward in the first tempo, into misura stretta, because if you just lift it in misura larga, the remaining tempo would be too long for a too short to be countered action against the resting opponent. Now, let's get back to proper Fabris and the very uneven streets to which he must have been accustomed. He, too, wants to have very short tempi that cannot be exploited by a resting opponent. When he states that each step needs at least two tempi, one for lifting the foot and one for putting it down, he's actually leaving room for major obstacles. Maybe his way of attacking would have looked more like this, using the rapier to avenge your fallen comrades that lie in front of you or something, I don't know. I've heard of living Filipino martial arts systems that also take uneven terrain into consideration, so the idea is anything but unusual. It is also a great chance to question how many movement patterns from Olympic fencing we subconsciously added to our image of rapier fighting. I guess it is decidedly not like modern epi fencing just with more fancy weapons. Oh, and what is more, Fabris nerds could, in my opinion, rewrite the Dresden lessons uh, for uneven terrain, using the three-stage distessa instead of the two-stage distessa by shifting things around until they fit. <laughs> Interestingly, the floating foot is by no means a peculiarity of Fabris and his students. The sort of Spanish rapier style of Gerard Thibault d'Anvers, as published in his monumental Académie de l'Épée from around 1630, explains the lifted foot concept too. I'm grateful to Sean Yu, who pointed this out in a YouTube comment to the previous Timing in Hima video. To quote a short description from chapter 15. Alexander, that is one of the fighters, interrupts his action with a hesitant pause as soon as he has raised his right foot in the air. Now we have found it most effective to show this moment in the image, so the student shall be more aware to always do this each time it is necessary to perform this same subjugation because these pauses will give him the time to recognize and prevent any of the counters which his adversary might plan to do during this action. In contrast, if he were to step right away from the first instance to the second, these instances refer to different measures between the fighters, or from the second to the third, without putting in any pause, he would be in grave danger of being wounded. One should also note that this practice will, from the beginning, not be pleasing to spectators for the slowness and the interrupted motions of the learner because of these pauses. It may be that, of those who read this, considering how these pauses are quite contrary to the old mode of fighting, where no one knows about making brief pauses, someone might wish to take issue with these instructions. I would ask them to suspend judgment until they have fully looked at the usefulness and self-assurance that they impart to someone who is in a fight. There isn't much to add here. Thibault not only uses what is fundamentally the same technique for reasons we have outlined before, he's also aware of the fact that these brief pauses, especially when students train them slowly, seem counterintuitive, like telegraphing. But using these moments of stillness allow you to choose the right moment for certain actions, just as Thibault said at the end of the quote. In different fighting systems, you might find other methods for uh, approaching a resting opponent. 
Philibert de la Touche, for example, in his 1670 Transitional Rapier book, suggests that you try to provoke the opponent to make a move so that you can enter measure and strike in the tempo of their reaction. If that does not help because they remain still, and I quote from the English translation by Réanier van Noort and Antoine Coultre, the least dangerous manner is to gain it, that is the measure, by imperceptibly approaching the right foot with the left foot. So here too, the suggested method is a kind of subdivision of a long tempo, as, in my understanding, moving the rear foot forward shortens the time needed to make a hit with the lunge that follows. However, before that lunge, there is a moment of stillness when the rear foot is placed down, which is why this is not one long continuous movement that the opponent could otherwise use against us. However, Philibert de Latouche later suggests that if one cannot find the opponent's sword and gain measures safely against them while they are still, one ought to retreat and try again, hoping they will eventually move and so give you a tempo. Personally, I think it is a weakness in a fighting system if it does not have a better solution to a problem than backing down and trying again. But who am I to argue against a certified French uh, Baroque fencing master? If anything, his suggestion confirms that he regarded the danger of a lurking opponent as severe enough that being safe was better than being efficient. The lighter transitional rapiers of this time might have added to that, a problem that I will address in the proper third timing in Hima video. For now, let's return to the early 17th century. Aside from the observation that a resting opponent offers us a smaller tempo than an opponent who performs an action, the second thing to learn from Fabris's three tempi lunge is that in certain situations you might want to move only your hand or foot, but not both at the same time, even if the action is already very short. The idea is that if the opponent suddenly moves, one of your limbs is resting and thus able to react faster than the one which is moving. If both were busy with moving, it would take slightly longer to respond. As you can see, a resting opponent is the ultimate test for your timing skills, apart from the fact that you also need a good sense of how to mechanically defend against their weapon. We need to be extra careful during our approach by subdividing our movements even more than before, and it can be necessary to only move one set of limbs at a time. Moving hands and feet independently can also come in handy in paired weapons disciplines. Look at our interpretation of a situation from sword and buckler fighting according to manuscript 133. We assume here that the opponent will counterbind, but may or may not advance immediately. Both options have to be countered differently, either by disengage called mutatio gladii, or by shield strike. The problem is that the first counter, the mutatio gladii, must be initiated early to be successful, at a point in time where it is not clear whether the opponent will also advance. If they advance, the mutatio may not work properly anymore, as we would need too much time to circumvent the opponent's weapons that have come closer in the meantime. But if we commit to the first counter option, how can we still perform the second? We start at a tempo, after all, and are frozen in motion. Switching from this movement to a second movement would be really tricky indeed, if, for instance, both had to be performed primarily with a sword. Our solution to this problem is using a different part of our body. When we notice during the first counter movement, the mutatio gladii, that it will not be successful and we have to adapt, the left hand comes into play with a shield strike, because it was resting until now and thus ready to react. The right hand now has more time to adapt to the new situation, and the disengage movement of the blade is transformed into a cut. Hence, moving our limbs independently has helped here to cope with the rapid change of situation. One could even argue that our right and left hand use different tempi. More generally, however, moving limbs independently of one another is most useful when advancing on a resting or lurking opponent, as mentioned earlier. What we should take away from all of this is that we cannot see footwork, 
and Blade Work 2 as something entirely mechanical. What matters is how long we need for each of our actions, if the opponent gives us the time, and if we quickly manage to arrive at yet another moment of stillness that allows us to adapt to a change of situation. Always remember that we go through all that trouble to ensure the success of every single of our movements. For us modern HEMA practitioners, these are useful concepts, because many people in our rather young community still have no plan of how to attack fluently and carefully. But instead, they wait for the right moment, just as the resting opponent described earlier. Proceeding against such resting or lurking opponents will thus require extra caution and adherence to the guidelines just discussed. Unless, of course, you also want to wait for your opponent to do something. Speaking of these lurkers, I will address this problem again in episode 3 of Timing in HEMA, when talking about the Zufechten in the Lichtenau tradition. Some of this relates to what I explained about passing steps with a longsword in the second episode, but as Zufechten contains too much new material, it will not be squeezed into this supplement video. As always, feel free to share your questions, your suggestions and your comments. Take care, train safe and goodbye.